you do. This is Clive Brook. It is said that Christian II, a 16th century king of Denmark, was informed one night that a courtier had been stabbed and killed in a tavern brawl. The candles had been extinguished during the fight, and the murderer was consequently unknown. Now, determined to discover him, the king ordered all who had been present to reassemble in the tavern. One by one, they were made to lay their hands over the heart of the dead man. As the last man, a soldier, obeyed the king's command, blood trickled from the mouth of the corpse. Thereupon, the soldier broke down and admitted the murder. This charming little tale is the origin of the belief that when confronted with the evidence of his guilt, the criminal will confess. Coupled with the maxim that a murderer will always return to the scene of his crime, it formed the basis of criminal detection for many years. The practice in England was to stick the head of a victim on the top of a pole, and for officers of the law to stand guard over it, scrutinizing the demeanor of each passerby. This was done with the trunkless head that was discovered on the left bank of the Thames early in 1726. It was only one of the appetizing episodes in the casebook history I'm about to tell you. By way of warning, or perhaps inducement, I've called the case Buckets of Blood. It was in the foggy dawn of a day early in 1726 that a night watchman at Horse Ferry, Westminster, left his post and walked a few steps down to the edge of the Thames. As he neared the water, he tripped over something and fell into the mud. Kneeling, he turned to see what the object was. What he saw made him rise to his feet with a cry. It was a human head. He took his ghastly discovery to another watchman, and together they went to the magistrate of the district, Mr. Justice Lambert. Well, you two, what is the meaning of disturbing me at this hour? I've not even breakfasted. Well, your lordship, it's like this. I'm a watchman. Yes, yes, but get to the point, man. What have you got in that sack? Go on, Bill, show him. I found this in the mud near my hut, sir, this morning. Good heavens! Return it to the sack, man. I stumbled on it as I was walking down to Return the... it to the sack, will you? There's mud dripping all over my carpet. I found this bucket just near where Bill found the edge. Take it out of the house, man. There's blood on it. It's bound to drip. Oh, my beautiful carpet. All right, very good. Well, well, what's to be done, your worship? Soon, sir, the procedure is well and truly laid down. The head must be washed, the hair combed, and then this most ugly specimen shall be posted about St. Margaret's churchyard for all and sundry to see. Thus, we shall perhaps discover the identity of this bodiless corpse. And now, sir, you may depart, leaving the evidence in the scullery, if you please. Oh, what an unconscionable hour to be shown such a hideous object. When the mud and blood had been washed away, it was seen that the head was that of a middle-aged man. But who he was, or what he was, it was impossible to know. Crowds soon gathered about St. Margaret's churchyard to view the exhibit. And on the third day, a shopkeeper called Ashby, John Ashby, excitedly grasped his companion's arm. Rex! Rex, look! What is it, John? The gate on the pole. Oh, I've already seen it. It's been up these past three days. But for sure, it's a mess. Come with me, Rach. Oh, you don't mean to drag me through this. Come on. Come here. Come on, Dad. Well, 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 now you have a close view, John. You satisfied? Yes, I am. Come on, Rach. Now, look here, John. I refuse to be dragged about like this. Very good, then. You go to the Eagle Tavern. I'll meet you there at two of the clock. Now, where will you be until then? I shall be talking to Mrs. Catherine Hayes about that head up out there on the pole. tell you how she came to be in London and why Mr. Ashby wanted to see her about the head on the pole. Now, at the age of 15, Catherine had quarreled with her father, a labourer, and had left her parents' home when she set off to walk to London a hundred miles of the crow flies. But at the first hospital she came to, she was diverted from her course. <laughs> Glad that you're a, you're a company wench, eh? What they call you, my pretty one? Cat, so please you, sir. So please me, eh? Gad, but you please me greatly. Uh, do you work here, Cat? No, sir. I'm on my way to London. Ha, ha, London City is no place for you, my lovely. Look about the room, lass. What do you see? <laughs> a goodly lot of men, sir. Fine officers all, I'd Indeed say. Indeed we are, big Gad. His Majesty's truest and most loyal soldiers. What? And we've all got a good eye for a woman, Cat. 
A woman like you, fine complexion, heavenly figure. How old are you, by the way? Fifteen, sir. But older than my years. <laughs> I'll wager you are. You've had a fine life with us, Kath, in our camp, you know. We've quarters at Great Ombersley. We're on our way there now. But that is in Worcestershire, sir. I'm for London. You were for London, Kath. But now... Ah, it's a fine life with the king's officers, Kath. Mm. Oh, sir! <laughs> you must not do that in so public a place. <laughs> Are you still for London, eh, Kath? No, sir. I think I'm for his majesty's officers, sir. But after two years, the officers became tired of Kath's company and she was advised to leave the barracks. Her next stop was in the county of Warwickshire, where she became servant to a farmer called Hayes. The farmer had a son, and Kath, at 17, was extremely attractive. Thus it came about that the elder Hayes soon found cause to have a serious talk with his son. Oh, come in, Arthur. I want to speak to you. It's about Catherine, isn't it, Dad? Yeah, you always were an honest lad. Yes, it's about Kath. She's only been with us a month, and people are already whispering about you and her. Well, let them whisper. I was planning to tell you anyway. Kath and I are married. What? How can you be? This is a joke. Some prank of yours. Oh, prank, Dad. We married secretly in Worcester last week. We're very much in love, Dad. I hope you won't do anything to make unpleasantness. Married to a mere slag of a serving girl? Uh, whatever you may say, you shan't alter my feelings. You'll both leave this house tomorrow. I never want to see either of you again. I hope you'd welcome Rich, me. Wretch, how dare you hope for anything after such action? Out of my house to you, eh? Out! Yes, Dad, I heard. But the next morning, Hayes Sr. repented a little and gave his son money on the condition that he and his wife should leave the district. He also granted him an allowance of 26 pounds a year. No mean sum in those days. Kath refused to live anywhere but London. And as Arthur Hayes was at this time still anxious to grant his bride's every whim, to London they went. Arthur took a house and let apartments. He made money. He opened a chandler shop and sold coal. He made more money. He started a pawnbroker's business. He made yet more money. But he was by no means happy. Kath, this cannot go on. What do you mean? It's the third time this week that neighbors have come to me with their complaints about you. Robinson from number 20 has just been in here saying he'd, he'd murder you if you crossed his path again. I hope you punished him for speaking in such fashion of your wife. I'm tired of standing up for you, Kath. Is it true that you told his wife that you'd seen him with that woman in the park? Of course I told her. You know what I think of such things. And if we women did not stand together... Why must this... you be forever making trouble with my friends? John Ashby was in here only yesterday asking if it was you who spread the rumor that he couldn't pay his rent. Well, he can't. You know it. And who are you to tell everyone about it? No one is perfect. You least of all. Do you think I don't know what happens in this house when I'm away on business? How dare you? Oh, don't deny it. Spare me that. Arthur, how can you? My husband. You know I love you more than anyone or anything. We leave here on Tuesday, Kath. You're ruining my trade and my reputation in the neighborhood. I've taken a house in Tyburn Road. We'll make a fresh start there. But the change of environment did not alter Catherine's nature. She still made trouble for her husband. She still was unfaithful to him when his back was turned. However, Arthur, in spite of his unhappy home life, continued to prosper in his pawnbroker's business. He also left three rooms of his house's apartments. One of the lodgers was a young tailor called Thomas Billings. Catherine liked his looks, and he hers. By the way, he was young enough to be her son. The mutual attraction led to a most severe quarrel between Arthur Hayes and his erring wife. And I returned from the labouring to keep you in your expensive ways, only to be told that Billings had been more than just a lodger in my absence. Do you expect me to sit alone while you're away? Am I to have no company? Not only do you cheat me at every turn, but you have such an orgy here with him that the whole neighborhood hears of it and laughs at me and pities me for being a fool, a deceived man. You are a fool. Cannot you open your eyes, see that you no longer please me? I wish you would have change, Arthur. I'm still young, you know. Another word in that tone, Catherine. You blind idiot. Do you expect me to deny the advances of an attractive youngster like... Oh, you brute! <laughs> Perhaps that will quiet. <laughs> and strange to relate, Catherine's disposition changed from that day forward in Arthur's presence. To him, she was gay and charming. But to Billings and another lodger named Wood, two rather simple souls, she showed her true feelings towards her husband, and they were not quite so charming. You know, Mr. Wood, what a good-for-nothing Arthur is. Well, He's been a good friend to me, Mrs. Hayes. Billings here can vouch for that, can't you, Tom? 
Well, I, I don't think he's all he seems to be. That's right, Tom. Of course he isn't. Two things you don't know. First, he's an atheist. Uh, oh, oh, is he? Yes. And I've heard it preached that to kill such men is right. So what sin it must be. And worse than that, he's a murderer. No. Would I say it about my own husband if it were not true? He killed two men in the country, buried them under a pear tree. That's why we came to live in London. My word, an atheist and a murderer. And with all that money, too. Yes, 1,500 pounds he saved. All of it comes to me on his death. But what a scoundrel he is, eh? These errant lies were not just idle chatter on the part of Catherine Hayes. Every story she concocted was told with a purpose. To secure the assistance of Mrs. Wooden Billings in the murder of her husband. for a cold in the world. I'm calling for a Guinness world of liquor. <laughs> you know, I'm not drunk. <laughs> Are you, Tom? <laughs> <laughs> drunk, not I. See, uh, he's... I'll wager you couldn't drink six bottles of Mountain and still be sober. If you can, I'll pay for it. And if it knocks you over, you pay. A bargain, a bargain. Six bottles of Malaga, eh? Poor me, a thirst quencher. I'll get the bottles. Have a drink, Mr. Wood. <laughs> oh, good God. Kick furniture. Well done, Tom. It was just the right moment. Now, remember your promise, you two. What? What, tonight? The best opportunity we've had. He's sure to be drunk after this. But I, I, I did not pledge myself. You did. To get rid once and for all of a murderer. To kill him means less than to kill a dog in the gutter. And I'll not be stingy with the money. You promised, didn't he, Tom? I heard him with these two ears. All right. Sweet lass. Sweet lass. <laughs> Halfway through the first bottle already. <laughs> I'll do it easily, Billings. Go to it then, Hayes. You've still got another five bottles. Ah. <gasps> That's one. Can't be bothered with Tanker from the bottle now. Up for a bit of air. <laughs> A few more. Oh, spilt. Spilt, hang it. I spilt some. <laughs> oh, don't count it against me, Billy. You're doing marvels, Hayes. Hurrah, <sighs> finished. Six throttles of mountain. And you pay. <laughs> where, 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 where am I? <laughs> I'm so giddy. He's completely insensible. Carry him onto his bed. Take the legs, Billings. I, I've got the shoulders. Uh, heavy with all that wine in him, huh? There, you lead the way. Lay him on the bed. I'll fetch the hatchet. When Catherine Hayes returned, Billings took the hatchet from her and struck Hayes on the head. But it was not sufficient. So Wood snatched the hatchet from Billings and dealt the victim two more blows. What shall we do with the body? Throw it into Marylebone Pond. We'll burn the clothes. The head we must put in the bucket and carry it to Westminster where we can throw it into the Thames. No one will ever find out who it is. Quickly now, we must finish by daybreak. And so it was that a watchman at Horse Ferry, Westminster, stumbled over something the next morning, and that a man called Ashby, three days later, thought he recognized the head on the pole in St. Margaret's churchyard and went to see Mrs. Catherine Hayes. 
Yes? Oh, it's Mr. Ashby, isn't it? I wasn't sure whether you'd remember me. Oh, yes. You know, I, you knew my husband before we moved here. Is your husband in, Mrs. Ace? No. Arthur's away. Oh? May I know where? Uh, Portugal. You're sure, Mrs. Ace? I have reason to doubt it. But perhaps you can convince me. Why has he gone to Portugal? It's a, a sad story, Mr. Ashby. Some time ago, my Arthur fought with a man. The man died from the blows Arthur struck, and uh, his wife was going to the constables about it. But finally, she agreed to say nothing on Arthur's promising to pay a certain annual allowance to her. Recently, Arthur lost a lot of money. He could no longer pay the woman the money, so he has fled uh, to Portugal. I see. Thank you, Mrs. A. Good day. Ashby quickly repaired to the Eagle Tavern to meet his friend, Reg Longmore, and there told him what Catherine Hayes had said, explaining also that he was sure that the head in St. Margaret's churchyard was that of Catherine's husband. Between them, they decided to test her story, which is the reason that Longmore visited the lady that afternoon, pretending that he was a friend of Arthur's. He was told the same story. Almost. But then, you see, Mr... Uh, uh, Longmore, ma'am. Mr. Longmore, my poor husband lost an amount of money so that he could no longer afford to pay this widow the allowance. In the end, against my wishes, of course, he decided to leave the city. And uh, where did he go, ma'am? Oh, I wouldn't tell anyone, you understand, but uh, oh, I would like to make contact with him, if possible. North of London, sir. He gave me no more exact address, but I think he is in Hertfordshire County. Oh, oh indeed. Well, thank you, Mrs. Hayes. You've been most helpful. And she never mentioned Portugal once. No, not once. Oh, she was not quite certain, but she thought he was in Hertfordshire. I think you're right about this affair, John. Well, I'm sure of it. Something else has happened since I saw you to confirm me in my suspicions. Oh? I went to see a rogue called Billings after you left me. He's a tailor and lodges in Arthur Hayes' house. I asked him if he'd seen the head in St. Margaret's churchyard. Well, go on. He said he hadn't. Whereupon I disclosed that I was sure it was his landlord's. And you know what was his reply? He cried... Nonsense. How could the head be his? I left him well in bed when I came to work this morning. But John, oh, we can go no further in the matter, for we cannot take the law into our own hands. Justice Lambert's the man for us. You speak truth, Rach, though I'm determined to be there when they make the arrest. On being told the story, Mr. Justice Lambert decided that there was a prima facie case against Catherine Hayes and that he would attend to the arrest himself. Summoning the assistance of two officers of the lifeguards and followed by Ashby and Longbore, he appeared at Mrs. Hayes' lodgings at nine o'clock that night. With no ceremony, they walked upstairs to her room. Open in the name of the law. Who's there? Open in the name of the law. As soon as I have put up the clothes. Hurry then, madam. Officer, have you the casket I gave you as we set out? Uh, yes, Your Worship, I have it here. It shall perhaps be required before this episode is through. Uh, now, madam, uh, are you prepared? What do you want? Officers, seize her. Look, there's Billings sitting on her bed. Thomas Billings, eh? I have a warrant for your arrest also. Make up another of your stories, Billings. Billings has been mending his stockings. His eyesight must be extremely good then, seeing that there is neither fire nor candle in the room. Why are we being arrested? Officer, give me that box. Here you are, Your Worship. Lift out its grisly contents. There, madam. Do you not recognize this? Oh, it is my dear husband. Yeah, now, why? That's better. In my arms like this instead of that box. I must have a lock of his hair. Oh. She's fainted. She has perhaps seen too much of his blood already. <laughs> Three criminals were then taken to the Old Bailey to await trial. Billings was the first to speak out in the hope of being treated leniently. On his advice, Madeleine Pond was dragged and the remaining limbs of Arthur Hayes were discovered. Wood then confessed also, but in spite of the whole ghastly crime being disclosed, Catherine Hayes maintained her innocence. Catherine Hayes, your companions, Wood and Billings, have confessed to the murder of your husband, Arthur Hayes, and have pleaded guilty in the forthcoming trial. As examining magistrate, it is my duty to inform you that unless you alter your plea of not guilty, you will have to make a defense, for which, in due course, you will be provided counsel. 
the enormity of your alleged offense has induced the king, whose gracious majesty may God preserve, to direct the prosecution through no less a personage than the attorney general. In the trial that then took place, the attorney general of England argued for the supreme penalty of the law in those days, hanging and then burning. The jury, in spite of Catherine's repeated cries that she was being wronged, brought in the verdict after only a few minutes. Members of the jury, look on this woman. Do you find her guilty or not guilty of the foul crime with which she is charged? We find her guilty. My lord! The female prisoner at the bar may speak. You have found me guilty, but I did not strike the fatal blow. Billings and Woody have admitted to that themselves. If I must suffer hanging, surely in view of their confession, I may escape burning. The request of the prisoner is denied. Catherine Hayes, you have been found guilty by just process of law of a most foul and heinous crime. To be burnt after hanging was a fate reserved for women. Men were hanged and then suspended by chains near the scene of the crime. Although Catherine's second assistant Wood cheated the gallows by dying in Newgate the day before his appointed execution, the corpse of Thomas Billings was duly strung up near Marylebone Pond, where the remains of Arthur Hayes had been discovered. As to the chief instigator of the crime, her end was almost more horrible than that of her victim. On May the 9th, 1726, the crowd about Tyburn, in spite of the layer of snow on the ground, was so great that only a few could see the gallows. But among those few were John Ashby and Reg Longmore, more than a little proud of their share in the apprehension of no longer Kath or Catherine, but just the woman Hayes. Here she comes, Reg. Can't see her face at the moment. Oh, they brought her on his, on his sledge. Oh, I wish they silenced that bell. It's the death knell from St. Sepulchre's Church. It'll stop when she dies. See, they're, they're chaining her to the stake. First they'll strangle her and then light the faggots. She looks calm. They've got the rope round her neck. Any moment now. She's up. She's up. Too soon. John, I can't see. They lit the fire too soon. The angman ain't then burst and let the rope go. She's trying to kick the faggots away. It is strange, perhaps, that fate should reserve such a death for such a woman. In any case, that was the macabre finale to the history of Catherine Hayes. Don't be too horrified by this story. It took place a long time ago, when it was much more difficult to keep a good head on your shoulders. <laughs>